on the island of Rarotonga. From this lagoon at Natangia, migrating ancestors of these young Polynesians set out on tremendous voyages five centuries ago, miles across the Pacific Ocean, to the land we now call New Zealand. Today, Cook Island Maoris are again venturing into new worlds, against a background of international trade and political development, leaving behind some of the old ways of living and entering the conveyor belt age, blending the sound of industry and automation with the carefree rhythms of Rarotonga. The flexible structure of Cook Island's life is being adapted to new forms as young Maoris learn to control the machinery of a changing national economy. But in the more isolated of the 15 islands, much of the traditional pattern of Polynesian life remains unaltered, simple, unsophisticated, centered on strong ties of home and family and the cherished plot of land which is the birthright of every Cook Islander. The precepts of Christianity have also been woven into the fabric of Cook Island's community life since the pioneer missionary John Williams proclaimed the Christian message on the site of this Rarotongan church in 1823. So today, religion and Maori custom sustain the people of the Cook Islands as they travel along a new road and build a diesel fishing vessel on the launching place of their ancestral canoes. On great voyages of discovery and migration in the 14th century, some Cook Islanders landed on the shores of Aotearoa to become branches in a strong new family tree of the Polynesian race, the Maori people of New Zealand. Now for many years, Maori and European have grown up together, learning to understand each other's culture. And as New Zealand citizens, Cook Islanders still come to this country to work, study and teach. Mr. Eric Pornier, for instance, is completing his teacher training in Wellington. And a qualified secretary, Ms. Tutai Are, is working in the Department of Island Territories. This department arranges New Zealand training and bursaries for several hundred Pacific Islanders every year and keeps in touch with them as they work through their courses of study. Among Cook Islanders here at present, Noa P. Tapere is studying to become an architect. William Bates is an engineer specialising in refrigerating machinery. And Constable Goodwin has completed the full training course of the New Zealand Police. New Zealand also provides training for the staffs of Ireland's medical services. And Dr. Enetama is here on a refresher course. Student nurses Maruiai and Atatoa, now training at Whangarei Hospital, both gained Island Territories bursaries for secondary education in this country. Graduation Day 1965 brings to Mr. and Mrs. Pokino at Canterbury University one of the rewards of a 12-year climb to higher education. Mr. Pokino takes his place in the graduates' procession to receive the degree of Bachelor of Engineering. Soon he will return to Islands to use his knowledge and skill in the service of his own people. Rarotonga Wharf is the lifeline for us in the Cook Islands. Everyone looks forward to boat day. The government ship Moana Roa carries most of our imports and exports and keeps us in touch with our families and friends. Among those we welcome with days of Frangipani are our people returning to work in the islands after training in New Zealand. Our first university graduate, Mr. S.M. Sadaraka, M.A., is now chief clerk to the government.
Our first leader of government business was elected in 1963. With guidance from the New Zealand resident commissioner, the executive committee at that time was already taking on some of the responsibilities of cabinet government. We recommend that five classrooms be built at Mangaia, two classrooms at Achu, in order to take advantage of the works teams. In education, as in government, we have been learning to manage our own affairs for some time. The Maori Culture Day, and secondly, the singing festival, and third, thirdly, the school. At frequent school. meetings, Maori headmasters and European advisors from the education department work together to improve our children's schooling. While at the General Hospital, Avarua, a visiting specialist from New Zealand and a Cook Islands doctor make regular checks on our children's health. Eye troubles are fairly common here, as in all tropical countries. The New Zealand specialist and his wife, as an eye surgery team, remove cataracts and give treatment for other eye diseases. They also offer professional advice to our own doctors and nurses and restore to many of our people the priceless gift of sight. We train some of our own nurses and dental nurses here to work in island clinics and schools. Enters at the mandibular foramen and passes down within the body of the mandible, within the bone. Toothbrush drill starts the day at the 23 primary schools run by the administration. This is one of the ways in which our children are adapting themselves to European influences as we move towards a money economy. In primary classes, the teaching language is Māori, and most of the teachers have graduated from our own training college at Rarotonga, largest of the 12 inhabited islands of the group. <laughs> Education at government or mission schools is free and compulsory between the ages of 6 and 16, and we have about 10,000 children, half our total population under 16 years of age. From our primary schools in all the islands, children come to Tereora College on Radotonga. Here the teaching language is English, and with some emphasis on agriculture and domestic science, our children take all subjects leading to the New Zealand School Certificate. We have modified the New Zealand High School syllabus to meet our needs in the Cook Islands of the future, remembering the best features of our Maori heritage. Music has always been part of our lives and distinguished visitors from New Zealand are welcomed to the school with songs in the Polynesian tradition. Most of the Māori and European teachers at Te Reora qualified at New Zealand training colleges and universities. So staff and students also have a keen interest in sport. End of term athletics show the style that won two gold medals for the Cook Islands at the first South Pacific Games. We have adopted most European sports. Every Saturday in the cricket season, there's a match on Rarotonga. Today, the administration versus Tupapa Village and a popular win for the Maori team. <laughs> in most of our islands, the coconut provides food, drink and many other necessities of life. Things to wear, houses to live in, copra for export. Hundreds of miles of ocean separate our small islands. The total land area is only 93 square miles, so our biggest problem is to produce more food and export crops to support a fast-growing population.
The agriculture department helps by raising new varieties of trees and plants, among them teak, citrus, coffee and passion fruit, for distribution to growers in islands where these plants will yield good cash crops. Experiments with pepper crops have proved successful and 40,000 seedlings are now being grown here for transplanting on the island of Mitiaro. We're also developing secondary industries, factories making clothing for New Zealand, for instance, but the products of the land, especially pineapple, tomatoes and citrus fruits, are still our most profitable cash crops. Nearly all our plantations are owned and worked by families, sometimes using technical and financial help from the agriculture department to produce the highest quality fruit for export. At a central depot on Rarotonga, oranges are washed, graded and packed. The Cook Island government guarantees the sale and shipping of quality citrus fruit to New Zealand. Fresh or processed at the local canning factory, all our fruit and other exports worth about a million pounds a year have to be loaded into lighters at the wharf. Then they're towed through the reef to overseas ships anchoring offshore, and these ships bring in the imports we need. Machinery for our industries, vehicles and implements for land development, and all the other goods we are beginning to need as we move forward towards European ways of living. Rarotonga, home of 9,000 of our people out of a total of 20,000, shows more signs of European influence than the other islands of the group. But even here, after a century of contact with European custom, our women still wear flowers in their hair as they did in old Polynesia, and family life is still the heart and center of our world. Yet, as a people, we know we have to go forward with the times. Once we built all our houses of Kiko, now we are learning to build with modern materials. So it is with our life as a nation. Political advances are being made to give us a greater share in managing our country's affairs, elections for a new legislative assembly, and proposals for self-government under a new constitution planned by the Cook Islands and New Zealand governments in partnership. Booklets in English and Māori explaining this constitution have been distributed to every householder in the islands. On Rarotonga, less than 30 miles round, with a road to every village, it was fairly simple to give the people the facts about these political developments by press, radio and postal delivery. To get this information to the other islands of the group, scattered over a million square miles of ocean, we broadcast special radio programs, then called in the Good Samaritans of the Pacific, Number 5 Maritime Squadron, Royal New Zealand Air Force, whose fine record of rescue and mercy missions will always be remembered with gratitude by the people of all the islands. Our job was to fly a government information mission to 11 outer islands of the Cook Group. One of them was Penrith where about 700 people live on a coral atoll of two and a half thousand acres. They export copra from the plantations and pearl shell from the lagoon. Sometimes we brought a few passengers from other islands, children and their parents returning from school or hospital. Because there are no regular sea or air services linking these isolated New Zealand communities. When we landed, there was always a courteous welcome for the information officer, Mel Taylor of Wellington, and his guide, John Webb, 
resident agent of Aitotaki. Then at public meetings called by island leaders, the booklets were given out so that the people could form their own opinions on the proposed constitution. Many people asked for assurances that the new constitution would safeguard their traditional links with New Zealand, their New Zealand citizenship, and the technical and economic aid which supports the island's economy. The system of government is what I wanted to discuss with you now. The Queen will still be Queen of the Cook Islands, as she is of Australia, New Zealand, and other Commonwealth countries. On all the islands, after the official meetings had closed with mutual expressions of friendship and goodwill, we were entertained by our generous hosts in true Cook Island style. Polynesian custom demands that the guests also must take part in the dance. All too soon we were airborne again, on the way to another information meeting several hundred miles away or to airdrop the booklets on the smaller atolls and islands where it wasn't possible to land. Rakahanga, Pukapuka and Palmerston, Mangaia and Moka, Manawai, Atiu and Mitiara. completed our mission a month before the elections. So all our people had an opportunity to understand the meaning of the Constitution well before election day. And at campaign meetings, candidates for the new legislature gave their opinions on our future political development. New Zealand invited the United Nations to send observers to the elections. The UN mission, including representatives from Cuba, Japan and India, was assisted by New Zealand officers from the Department of External Affairs and Island Territories. Other members of the mission came from Togoland and the United States under the leadership of Mr. Omar Adil of the Sudan. The decisive general election was held on April 20th, 1965. The government to be elected by the votes of all men and women over 18 will decide whether to amend, reject, or accept the proposed constitution for self-government in the Cook Islands. Eight thousand people voted, 93 percent of the electorate, proving that we have a lively interest in the political future of our island home. Polling stations were crowded all day and it was well into the night before electoral officers in company with the United Nations observer began counting the votes. Six. Polling figures from the 12 electorates were relayed to the waiting crowd at Avarua and broadcast to New Zealand and the Outer Islands. One, three, three, 133. Soon after midnight, the charts began to show final returns. 
Early next morning, it became clear that the general election had been won by the Cook Islands Party, with the highest individual total of votes recorded by Dr. Manea Tamarua, Deputy Secretary of the Party. Led by Mr. Albert Henry, the CIP won 14 out of the 22 seats in the 1965 Legislative Assembly. The party accepts the principle of internal self-government with amendments to three of the 88 clauses in the new constitution. After amendments in the New Zealand Parliament to the new constitution, Mr. Albert Henry was elected the first Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. The population of Rarotonga doubles as relations and friends from the other islands in the group pour in to celebrate internal self-government. On September the 9th, the New Zealand delegation arrives, led by the Governor-General, Sir Bernard Ferguson, and the Prime Minister of New Zealand. and ceremony of other parliaments is brought to Avarua when the governor opens the first parliament of the Cook Islands under the new constitution with a message from the Queen. ...watched with great interest by many communities beyond the sea. Majesty the Queen expressed to me the most direct personal interest in this occasion and charged me to give you her greetings. I now read out once again the message she sent you on Constitution Day. <laughs> On the occasion of Constitution Day, I send my warmest greetings to all my people in the Cook Islands. <laughs> Although I have not yet been able to visit you in person, I have always rejoiced to hear news of your progress and welfare. The Prime Minister, Mr Holyoke, brings greetings from the people and Parliament of New Zealand. It's only a day to be remembered and celebrated by you the government and the people of the Cook Islands. Unless you want to change it, the close links which have, we have enjoyed with you for so long will continue just as before. And citizens of the Cook Islands will still be citizens of New Zealand, entitled to the rights and the privileges and the protections to which New Zealanders are entitled. Mr. Albert Henry, the Cook Islands' first Prime Minister, replies to the Governor-General and other speakers. We have uh, this morning witnessed a truly historic and moving event. I might add that it may go down in history that the opening of the Cook Islands Legislative Assembly is the longest opening in the history of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Your presence here on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen have accorded us the great honor of opening the first parliament of the Cook Islands under the new constitution. Last month, Dr. Tamarua and I expressed before a forum of the United Nations that self-government was the wish of an overwhelming majority of the Cook Islands people. It now remains for us to prove to the world that our choice was the correct one. And in the belief that each subscribes to the common good, the government of the Cook Islands will advance confidently under collective leadership, individual responsibility, 
and public participation. So help me God. looks forward to a continuing happy relationship with the Cook Islands and along with the rest of the world wishes them happiness and prosperity in their newfound internal self-government. <laughs>